This is an, an age of disruption, of profound revolutionary change. What we're really asking ministers is to empower the ambassadors. The only thing that you really push forth is the truth. You don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic. Good afternoon. My name is Ashley Furlong and I'm a reporter covering healthcare in Europe. You're watching Politico Live, the live extension of Politico's journalism. I'm coming to you from Politico's offices in Brussels. This is a live taping of our third episode of our EU Confidential In Focus mini-series on HIV in Europe. Just yesterday, we brought you an episode on HIV criminalization. And the week before, Sarah Tessier and Christina took you inside a French prison. Today we're going to talk about the efforts to end HIV transmission in Europe and whether a cure is within our reach. HIV research has enabled the disease to become a chronic condition, but the possibility of a cure offers a tantalizing possibility. No more daily pills, no more potential side effects. We're not there yet, but there are exciting research on gene therapies, vaccines and immunotherapies that could offer the hope that a cure could be within reach in the future. But at the same time, as the last two episodes of this podcast have shown, there is still a long way to go in ensuring equal access to treatment, prevention tools, and to change societal attitudes around HIV. As you will hear today, the reality is if we don't fix the stigma, the treatment gaps, and the testing, even if we eventually find this great new shiny cure, it isn't going to get to all those who need it. It's the right time to be talking about this, as just this week, the Spanish presidency confirmed that it will be making tackling stigma and discrimination around HIV a priority. We'll be discussing this and more with our panelists, but first, just a few housekeeping remarks. I would like to say a big thank you to our partner Gilead for making this event possible, and thank you to our audience both on site and online for joining us. We want this event to be as interactive as possible, so you can tweet um, using the, the, the at Politico and um, you can ask questions through Slido using hashtag Europe Ends HIV. I'll prioritize questions that are sent with a name and an organization so that it's transparent for our panelists and our viewers. You can already share your thoughts and answer the question presented by Gilead. It's one of those little word clouds, so you enter your answer to the question, what is the key priority at the EU and national levels to eliminate the HIV epidemic in Europe? I've already responded with my thought. Um, before we get started, we're going to hear some remarks from our partner, Michael Elliott, Vice President for Medical Affairs in Europe, the Middle East, Australia, Canada, um, at Gilead Sciences. Um, thank you, Michael. You can... Thanks very much. Is this microphone working? Yes, it is. Well, it's uh, great to be here. Thank you, Ashley, for the introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you here on behalf of Gilead Sciences, and we're I'm really delighted to be able to sponsor this. I think it's the first live podcast from Politico Europe, so well, well done on that. How to end the HIV epidemic in Europe. When will Europe get there? Um, and I think there's a lot of, of positive things to say about this, but there's still plenty of work ahead. The 95, 95, 95... Uh, percent goals of, of UN AIDS uh, seem achievable by 2030, but there is um, this work to do, and I think partnership and working together is critical. Um, over the years, and we're actually just talking about this at the beginning, highly active antiretroviral therapy has made a huge difference to people uh, living with HIV, but also we've moved to the era of prevention as well. Um, so control is there and, and, and should be available for everyone, and, and equity and working on stigma is, is really important um, work for everyone here. Uh, the potential cure or vaccine is still being worked on hard by many researchers around the world. Um, many pharmaceutical and biotech companies like Gilead ourselves are working on the various different options uh, for these. Uh, but it's still, even though there are options in, in clinical studies, this is still um, a way away. So in the meantime, 
It's working on the innovations that are in our hand, um, the political will um, and the community will that we have to work together um, to keep on, uh, again, heading towards those UN AIDS goals that I talked about earlier. We collaborate well, I think, in Europe, and I think Europe is a region that could achieve these goals um, on the target and could achieve the goals ahead of, of other parts uh, of the world. Um, but again, we have to keep on working with vulnerable communities, keep on working against stigma, and making sure we target innovation. Um, uh, rather than just sometimes looking at cost, we should look at innovation and the value to our societies. And, and Gilead is very happy to be a partner in that journey. We've been there um, since some of the earliest days and we'll keep on uh, working on this, working with many people in this room uh, as well. Ultimately, working together across Europe will be uh, the way we get to success finally by 2030. Um, so we'll keep on investing in R&D and in innovation. Um, we do that all the time. We always aspire to be better than we are. And we always look for feedback to, to challenge us and, and drive us to that better place. So I'm looking forward to listening to this panel discussion and the questions that follow. Um, as I said, we have the tools at our disposal. It's now up to our, our will and our energy and our collaboration to get you there. So thank you all for your, your attention. And I'll hand back to Ashley. Thank you, Michael, for those. Thank you, Michael, for those very on-point remarks, because we're going to be talking about many of those issues with our panellists today. And speaking of the panellists, um, please make your way to the stage. Um, you can come up. <laughs> there we go. Um, with me today, directly to my left, we have a, a familiar face for many in Belgium, uh, Maggie de Blac. She is the member of the Chamber of Representatives and a former Minister of Social Affairs and Health in Belgium. Next to her, we have Anne Isabel von Lingen, a Policy and Programme Manager for Combination Prevention at the European AIDS Treatment Group. And we have um, MEP Sara Serdas, a Portuguese MEP from the S&D Group, who is a member of the ENVI Committee and the S&D Coordinator of the COVI Special Committee and the Sunt Committee. So very health focused. Um, I'm going to get right into it, um, and I'm going to start with um, Anne, uh, Isabel. We're speaking about a cure, um, and I know we're not there yet. How far away are we? How you know? How what's the what's the state of play at the moment? <clears throat> so um, I'm I'm not a scientist, so it's more for researchers to say. I think where there's no cure, it's not close, but there are strategies to finding it that we didn't have before. Um, so I think we need to continue investing it in uh, research and Europe is uh, falling behind in its investment in research, both for the cure and for the vaccine. So because it wasn't mentioned, so I would like to, to refer to it. That's interesting about, um, you know, falling behind. Uh, Sarah, I'm wondering this, you know, continued investment in R&D for new therapies, vaccines and this eventual cure, you know, why, why is that important and what would you like to see happen in Europe with regards to sort of investment in this, in this research and development? Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question and uh, just before starting, good afternoon everyone and, and uh, congratulations to Politico to actually uh, record an episode of such an important topic. Uh, for everyone, even though sometimes it gets uh, lagged behind, I think we're going to discuss that further. What What is the aim here? The aim here is to, as it was stated before, is to make uh, the available treatment or cure to reach those that truly need it. If we have, uh, at the moment, we have a treatment. And the main goal as uh, health professionals it to, is to have that reach those that need it and to the most uh, different groups because we know that HIV is now turning into a, um, a very directed epidemic and we need to be able to reach them, uh, these vulnerable groups and uh, also to reach our goals. And I think it's of the utmost importance to have the Spanish presidency query regarding HIV and breaking the stigma as one of their priorities because that's one of the key blockers uh, to make people reach uh, even uh, testing or understanding uh, if they are infected or not. We're going to be speaking a bit about the, the Spanish presidency and potentially even the Belgian presidency, which is not too far away. Um, 
but you know, we, we're saying that this is still, still a long way to go. And even when you have these tools, getting them to the people who actually need them is difficult. And sort of the first hurdle in that is reimbursement. Maggie, when you were health minister, that was a quite a big win for you. You managed to get PrEP reimbursed. I'm wondering, can we go back to that time and you can explain a little bit about what those negotiations were like, what those discussions were like, and how, you know, maybe how things have changed since then? Well, I think it's uh, still difficult to get reimbursement. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but why did I decide to reimburse PrEP? Because I was convinced uh, when I knew uh, how it worked to, to get the viral load as uh, uh, low as possible, that that would be a game changer really for the new infections uh, we had every year. And we saw that there was the, uh, the number of new infected was about uh, 1200, 1300, and then the year after, uh, 50 more or less, but there was not nothing that could have really. And then we saw after reimbursement of PrEP, and of course, um, also giving uh, um, guidance by people uh, in communities, not doctors, because p people, when they s feel sick, they don't always go to a doctor. And so also prevention. Then we saw that the number of new infections dropped uh, from 1,200 to 700. And that was really the, the, the proof that we had made a good choice. Of course, um, you have some criticism also if, if you take a, a, a decision like that as Minister of Health and people started to send mails, uh, I have a disease, uh, there is no cure for it and you're going to give that to uh, HIV positive people and so on. So, But for me, a patient is a patient and the patient has to be helped and that's what you're doing it for. And since your time um, as health minister, how have you seen things shift? And you know, have you seen posit further positive developments? Yes, uh, if you you call uh, the targets, the goals, we see that we are 94 for to know the high HIV status. We are at 89 to the access to antiviral treatment, and we are at 9 to 7, uh, what we mean with the viral load. Why is it, uh, but we sti I think we could do better, uh, but uh, why is it uh, so difficult to uh, have access to antiviral treatment? Uh, because we have a number of people here living here, but not being on the radar, not having social protection. So that is a problem. So for that, we also have centers. We have three uh, reference centers, but they work uh, in a multidisciplinary way with also volunteers and, and, and things like that. People who are really want to help the vulnerable groups. And uh, that we see now that uh, the access is slowly getting better, but we are not there yet. So, uh, so of course, in a, uh, the making progress is not uh, to have won the battle. Uh, mm. So... Yeah, we have to continue, yes. On, on that, Anne, Isabel, so it seems like we, we're getting there, and in some countries in Europe, we're nearly there, but there is still that gap, and I'm wondering why you think it's so important that, that those last little gaps are closed before we even think about new treatments, new a new possible cure. You know, Why do we need to close those gaps before we think about rolling out these shiny new things? It's not an either or. We need both. And uh, like uh, you will not get me saying like either or it's both. So, and it's interesting because it's true that in Belgium is one of the few countries that uh, that provides, you know, urgent medical assistance or ARV, uh, but not from what I know, not prev not prep for prevention. So it's interesting that we reimburse press, but not for undocumented uh, um, people. People uh, can go on an anonymous. Uh, uh, to have the, the the blood sample, so that they can be anonymous, and then we there are uh, organizations mm -hmm. where we have not uh, reimbursement by our system of social uh, care, but they they are reimbursed by the financing of those centers. But for some. It is, n they don't find a way. Yes, you're right. But that's why I'm saying that it's really important to look at those who are not getting the, the treatment and it's the hardest part in the in the game in, in a way that, uh, so we really need to find, and as you mentioned, uh, 
services or task shifting, um, taking care out of a hospital sometimes or prevention services out of uh, clinics, um, in working with peer-led services uh, that are more trusted by some of the key population, like what we call key populations. Um, but also, um, it was interesting that uh, Michael previously mentioned stigma, but I think what's worse even than stigma, because if it was just stigma and discrimination, no, we have criminalization, active criminalization of people, and which puts people or puts people to the margins where maybe risk taking is higher, where access to tr prevention or treatment is lower. So you're setting up for failure in a way. So if I'm, I'm, you know, there's the criminalization of HIV transmission, non-disclosure and exposure. There's criminalization of drug use and possession. So people are going to to prison sometimes for little, uh, for no violent offense. Um, so there's that. There's a criminalization of uh, of sex work, and I would like to congratulate Belgium for changing its legal framework because we have seen that during COVID, for instance, sex workers didn't have any social protection, um, so they were taking even more risk if they had to really work to just to live. So I think that's an example that should be followed, and the example of Portugal with a decriminalization of uh, of drug use. I think we need to make this courageous political decision to move forward because without that, we can have treatment, but they will not be accessible for those uh, population. And it's really a social injustice. Mm. Maggie, just on that, as uh, before the uh, the session started, you were telling me about some um, innovations about, you know, reaching these uh, marginalized populations and, you know, way, these sort of peers, you know, peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, support in a way. I'm wondering if you could explain a bit about, you know, how you reach uh, these populations in ways that might not be the doctor coming in uh, from outside into the community. There, there are sort of alternative ways, and it seems like Belgium has, has sort of found some interesting uh, ideas yes. there. Well, we, we sat together with the organizations like uh, Cavaria uh, and others, and they said, of course, that uh, people are afraid to go to the doctor. Eh? And so then we decided that we could have testing by volunteers, by work uh, helpers, uh, and people who were convinced they could do something good. And we um, helped them a bit, by, uh, but they did the work they did on their own, because they have the conf confidence of, pe of people, so that there are people they know for other things like uh, drugs and so forth. Uh, but then the, the, the confidence is much more in their uh, collaborators and uh, then in a doctor. So first they, ha they have to have the diagnosis and then of course there, there has to be said that there is a way to get uh, cured or to live, uh, to, to have a normal life expectancy. But there is also the mental uh, uh, shock of being infected, of course. Uh, so there, they're also helped. Uh, so it's multidisciplinary. And uh, in most cases, they get the people towards a doctor that they know that is going to help them. Eh? And they have so, a sort of network. And f people have difficulties to find a doctor, to find a dentist, to find uh, every help they can. And uh, uh, of course, they want to avoid to be uh, hospitalized because then uh, uh, so they want to say it themselves or not to say it themselves. It's their decision. And I think the confidence in uh, people who can help them is very much more important than the quality of our, uh, uh, medic of our medical system. Sorry, you um, earlier this year wrote a question to the European Commission on the written consent requirements for testing. Can you explain a bit about what this means, what the question was about, and, and why this is something that you're concerned about? Yes, uh, that was a question I made to the Commission and they just replied uh, a few weeks ago. So basically, in uh, some countries, such as I can give you the example of Portugal, uh, when you go to the hospital, we can make an opportunistic uh, screening. So we can screen you for HIV and you just uh, give oral consent. But in some regions, it was uh, seen, some regions in Europe, even countries, so it depends how the system, health system is organized, um, the, the patient needed to give 
written consent and we're talking about the same uh, blood to sample tube and this uh, posed a barrier because the patient didn't want to have that written consent in their uh, medical file so I would like I, I asked the, the commission uh, to, to provide us some because what Dr told us it was uh, because of liability issues. So we wanted to have uh, the Commission stand on this to ensure to reduce this barrier that it will be all right. Obviously, response didn't uh, went clear enough on that. But this goes in line with the uh, stigmatization that still there is for these types of infections and disease. You don't have that, for instance, if we're um, dealing with uh, hepatitis A, for instance, um, but we have it for HIV. Why? It's, uh, it's not the death sentence that it was four decades, uh, three decades ago. Uh, it's something that we can live with. There's tools for PrEP, for preventing. There's tools for treatment. There's tools to live with the lower uh, viral loads. And the key here is the diagnosis. So if we cannot do that at the hospital and we create this barrier as policy makers or even on the, as regional policy makers, we're creating a barrier. We're actually contributing to not reach these goals, to not close these gaps. And it's of the utmost importance that we actually remove these barriers. It's almost going back to basics, you know, going back to the sort of the beginning where, you know, we're focusing on testing and it's it's that sort of that needs to be. Anna Isabel, you have a... No, it's a combination. So that's why we call our <laughs> program combination prevention, because it's not just testing. It's not just prep. You need uh, uh, an array of, uh, of services. And uh, we recently did a survey of what community believes is combination prevention services. And it ranged from like condoms, from uh, testing, uh, prep, uh, but it also included uh, like support for to find housing, support like legal assistance, mental health support. So there was a uh, a range of issue harm reduction, uh, op uh, opioid agonist therapy. So there's a there's a yeah, it's going and without you know sometimes a person without uh, substitution treatment it will be or harm reduction services to follow like the treatment. So it's the person needs you. We need to look at the needs of the person and then arrange the services Around. to create an environment for the person to to get tested, to take prevent, like to use the prevention tools that work for that person, uh, whoever that person is. Because um, now we, there are still some restrictions on uh, on who can access treatment in many in many country, and also on the stigma. I just wanted to. Uh, echo that there's still a lot of stigma yeah, in society, but also in healthcare. So when people with HIV go, they have uh, the b comorbidities burden is is uh, quite high. So every time they 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 go to a different specialist, or they might face or dentist, they might face uh, discrimination. So it affects the quality of life as well. Um, and so, you know, even we can't talk about like the basics of getting treatment to people, but we also need to look at like innovation, of course, in treatment because people have different comorbidities, they have different needs. So I'm afraid we have to work in on parallel tra several parallel tracks. This holistic approach in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from um, Isatel Saar on this testing question. Uh, they ask, do you think policies that diversify and enhance the offer of HIV tests could help address the problem of late diagnosis across Europe? Um, and I think that's quite interesting because, Maggie, you, you were speaking sort of about getting tested to people in interesting ways, but there's also different kinds of tests and there's self-testing. Um, anyone, maybe Anne, Isabel, you wouldn't start, or Maggie? Well, for some people, they like to do first the self-testing because they want to be uh, able to ha know it the first. So, so. And then they, they have to be followed to take the next steps. We're doing a lot of testing, actually. Uh, also, when you give blood, when you get a small operation, uh, we do a lot of testing in Belgium. And that uh, then we discover... Uh, HIV infections uh, on patients who didn't it, thought they would never get it, so they don't know where or when they get infected, but they are. So of course that is a, uh, the first step is to be very very quick. 
uh, to see that they are infected and because then the comorbidities, they are less if they are uh, quite quick uh, uh, diagnosed. So, so that is also very important. And then, of course, uh, uh, the working together, the multidisciplinary working together. And uh, of course, the dentist has to know that uh, it's an HIV. Uh, but, you know, um, you you can uh, talk to each other. I mean, uh, uh, I, I've been a general practitioner for 25 years. I had several uh, HIV patients, the, but only one died because he was too late diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And uh, the others, they still live. So, <laughs> But I know that they are difficult to find uh, a dentist, to find uh, a nurse and things like that. And then when you are the general practitioner, you know who will accept them as a patient. So that for them is very important because they are afraid to say it, they are afraid to ask it. But of course, you know, when you are a, a health worker, you have to have protection. So, okay. I I also think we need to. It was it, uh, it was in the word cloud. The U equals U. So when you're uh, undetect, when you have an undetectable viral load, you are, you don't transmit. And I think that paradigm is still unknown for the majority of the population, even in healthcare. Mm -hmm. So I think there needs to be a lot of effort to raise awareness in hospitals, in everywhere, like that, in general population. Mm. Um, I think people are still stuck to the 1980s, 90s. Um, so, and Sarah, on stigma, we've been speaking about this and how it sort of is p still pervasive, even though we come so far in many other areas. I'm wondering, you know, you're also a doctor, how at the sort of political level, when you, you know, you're working in the European Parliament, how you manage, how you're able to sort of um, bring that experience and, 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 and knowledge of the effect of that stigma on um, your patients and um, on your constituents. I'm wondering how you, you know, how you communicate that to to your fellow fellow MEPs and how that can be sort of brought to the political level, sort of addressing stigma. I know we heard it from the Spanish presidency, but practically, you know, what does that actually mean? Yeah, practically, it means a lot of uh, talking with uh, my colleagues. Also, that there's a lot of colleagues interested in these topics, but we don't talk uh, as we should on the stigma and how we can actually make policies that can address it. And I'll give you an example. Why don't we use the EU for Health program to address uh, stigma in the healthcare uh, field? And why don't we implement programs addressed to better better training health prof professionals on how to deal with, uh, with uh, HIV stigma? And this is just an example of how we can do it. There's many, many other examples and there's much more expertise out there. But first and foremost, we need an, an Hence, my, my praise to Politico is we need to, to put this topic on the agenda because we had a lot of focus on health in the past years due to the pandemic. Uh, but we and, and it was perceived by many people outside the health field that, oh, health is actually crucial for our society, uh, but we cannot... Uh, let it uh, die or reach the second second uh, degree or, or, or so. I usually give the example that the health debates in the parliament were uh, before the pandemic were at 9, 10 p.m. and now they get uh, prime spots. So we need to keep working not to lose that prime spot. And for that, we need to keep addressing all this uh, stigmatization, which also links to another very important and more uh, more up in the priorities, for instance, of the Commission, but also now in the Parliament with the Sense Health Committee, which is mental health. And this is something that can, can, can have a huge impact on the mental health of people living with HIV. And it's something that I'm, as main rapporteur of the mental health report, which I, I think I can say here, it's already, it's already official. It's something I aim to bring to the first report of the Parliament, European Parliament on mental health, how we can also address stigma of other diseases, especially HIV, which is a disease that got so much spotlight in the 80s and 90s. Mm. 
We have a question here about the um, uh, Spanish presidency. It's from Andre Zanaglio. Um, they ask, how can we turn the planned Spanish declaration into concrete actions on progress on ending the epidemic in Europe? And that's similar to what we're talking about now, but sort of concretely, what do we want the Spanish presidency to do? Because, you know, it's all very well, um, uh, you know, saying they want to tackle stigma, but I suppose it's what we actually want to see in that declaration. And Isabel, I'm sure you have some things you'd like to see there already. Yes, we have countless of <laughs> action plans and uh, we need action. And um, action means money. <laughs> so if there could be a project or, you know, there could be earmarked funding for a project funded by eu for health for Horizon, you know, who doesn't, doesn't ask, doesn't get. So yeah, obviously. <laughs> so I think that could be a tangible outcome of, uh, of the Spanish presidency work. Uh, and, you know, supporting ECDC adequately. I mean, we're glad to hear that they got an expanded mandate, but I think uh, having staff to actually work on... Uh, I mean, it's always... No, I get the message. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and there, yeah, the parliament can can have a, a role. Uh, yeah a wider role we expanded the mandate of ECDC but we also as uh, uh, it's uh, at, as uh, f the the registrators in charge of the financing also uh, we need to ensure that there's adequate uh, resources and that's something we aim to to actually start the discussions for the next um, uh, MFF um, because it's of the utmost importance that it does not happen what happened with this MFF, which was that health only got 500 million euros, but that it was necessary a pandemic to, to more than raise it by 20 fold. So the, the proposal by the Commission went from 500 million to 9.4 billion. We ended up with 5.3, which is outstanding and it's remarkable, but we need to keep, uh, uh, we need to keep the momentum my life to to ensure there's uh, enough finances to enable these resources to be able to put on the ground to serve these populations because it is uh, as we stated in the beginning there's some gaps that need to be closed and these gaps won't be made through an EU approach on HIV but the EU has a responsibility to provide the tools and mechanisms that member states can apply it on the ground and actually uh, together with the different stakeholders in the local communities to reach these uh, groups, these more vulnerable groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anne Isabel, you want to do just to sh briefly? No, it's just to, to welcome the fact that the European Commission has allocated 5 million euros uh, from the EU for Health program to community based services. So we have a project now for three years where the Commission is supporting NGOs to deliver uh, testing, prevention, different services to communities that, uh, as, as, as in Belgium, you were referring to. So we hope that this will be continued in the, um, in the future but it's to be commended. And this political world, something that Michael mentioned as well. And Maggie, I'm wondering if you think that there is sufficient political will to get to these goals, uh, not just in Belgium. It seems like there might be in Belgium, but the whole across the whole of the EU and, and where, you th where, where you see that. Well, I certainly hope there is the will, but there has to be the funding also in the countries. And, and you know that uh, you, you have your budget for health. Uh, now it has been uh, absorbed or more than t uh, uh, enough by Corona and uh, the, the post-Corona uh, for the long COVID and so on patients. So I think that it's also uh, very important that there is enough funding in the countries uh, for that and that uh, it's not why you're tackling the, the, the pandemic uh, um, uh, consequences that you don't have to tackle the other one. So because that's for one health, it's it's uh, putting a bucket there when all the, the roof is uh, leaking. So uh, and then you say we will put it there afterwards. So that's not that's not what we have to do. So I think. Um, the most important for people, if you ask one, someone who is sick, what is his biggest wish? It's not to uh, win uh, the lotto, but to be healthy. And so that I think you, that's the best uh, thing you can do for people, give them health and stay, let them stay healthy. 
we haven't only seen this shift sort of away from the health focus post pandemic, we've also sort of seen a rightward shift in many countries. Um, and I'm wondering, Anne Isabel, if this is something that you concern, this political sort of shift to the right, if that's at all concerning about efforts to end AIDS, if, if that's something that you think might fall off the political radar? There are several risks. I mean, just to uh, just to roll back, there's the question of sustainability of the health systems. Um, sorry for going back to that, because mm -hmm. I think one of the challenges is that, uh, like when we talked about diagnostics, diagnostics are expensive. Um, so it's needed like to reduce the price of diagnostics, uh, like self-testing needs to be reduced for people to actually access them. Uh, but also treatment and, you know, if, you know, some countries still don't have access to n innovative treatment like long-acting injectables for HIV treatment. So th I think there's huge differences. And um, when policymakers have to make decisions uh, and you have a non-popular population that, you know, your voters don't like, uh, it will be easier to justify if the treatments are cheaper. Um, you know, when you don't... Cause these are, I mean, you, you, maybe you can speak to that, but, and the, the, the pop populist turn in Europe is, yes, a, a danger. Uh, Sorry. I would, yep. It's a danger uh, because I think we, there's a risk of, ro of rollback. Uh, you know, we see it in Poland, we see it in Hungary, C services are closing. Um, uh, sorry, is this something you're concerned about with the European elections coming up, that we might see this sort of uh, more populist shift I with regards to HIV, but also uh, health more broadly? Like, how could that affect um, sort of health policy files uh, in the future? Yeah, that's a worry that hits me every day now, almost, and especially with the current uh, movements in the parliament. And it's something that uh, that worries me because I, I was, when I was born, I, Portugal was already in the EU. So uh, this is my reality. I, I this is the reality I'm, I'm familiar with, and we know that the EU is not a, a static project; is a dynamic, ever-evolving project. And my worry is that we have less Europe less EU in the next European Parliament, and that means uh, less EU in uh, health uh, policies and less, uh, and consequently less funding and, and resources and programs, because, for instance, a lot of stakeholders in the ground, a lot of actors that l work with local communities get their funding through um, EU programs, and this is something that will directly influence this. So I'm very worried, uh, not only for HIV and the health uh, field, but but also for uh, the climate emergency. But this is something that, again, uh, we need to be able to communicate what are we doing out here, the importance of next year elections, not only um, to explain wha wha what are we what are we candidating for, but also to ask voters to go, please go to vote and choose your representatives for the parliament. And this is something that struck me uh, when I was a candidate. I came from civil society, I, not from the political field. And when I, when, when I was elected, only one in every three voters in Portugal went to vote for the EU elections. And perhaps this is something that we need to surgically address because all of this can disappear, all of these discussions, all of these momentums, if we have a shift in the European Parliament and we are already feeling this, this not shift, but we're f feeling this during the current uh, negotiations for different files. You, ha you have the most, most famous one with the nature restoration law, but we have other files that uh, are already uh, sensing the waves of, of uh, the, this change. I'm going to look a little bit more broadly and more globally. You know, we're talking about Europe here, but you know, where HIV is still an even more significant threat is in Southern Africa. And Maggie, I'm wondering why you think it's possibly important for Europe to also care about this global impact of HIV. Why should Europe also be looking globally when they look regionally, should they also be looking to the rest of the world and how the rest of the world is trying to tackle HIV? 
I think uh, next year is an important year, not only because of the elections, but uh, of course there is also the uh, the General Assembly, and uh, there, of course, uh, we have a technical advisory group. I'm uh, uh, the president of that, so so working on the One Health, how to implement One Health, not only in Europe, but all over the world. So that is uh, uh, not so easy because not. Uh, every continent, not even, is at the same uh, level of uh, uh, healthcare status. So, so that uh, is something we are uh, worrying about. But we are preparing it uh, with a very international uh, working group of 22 people on one health. That means not only doctors, politicians, but also uh, social workers, uh, agriculture. And there uh, we see that there is a big defeat. Uh, there are the climate changes that give, uh, are a threat to health in some countries. But there are also the political changes, of course. And there are also uh, the, the funding of the health system is also very different in different countries and uh, so of course we uh, we will have a report uh, uh, ready before the general <laughs> assembly and then um, but it will also has to be give some liberty to the the countries the member states uh, uh, the, the 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 country working together like in africa there is a big difference uh, the sub-saharan region until south africa is you cannot say for africa i mean it's uh, very different so uh how they can implement it uh knowing where they are uh, now and how to improve their systems. And uh, I think uh, it's necessary to make, it's not, not easy on one health, uh, but uh, everything is, uh, if uh, Corona virus has uh, teach them something that, uh, this, that you, you have to look at all the aspects and not just thinking, oh, it's a virus there and here, and it's uh, only the, the birds and only the, the pigs, uh, but it won't ever get to men. That's not true. So, and also in agriculture, and um, uh, so veterinary is very important. So that's why we have a one health approach on that. And I think, uh, of course, it has to be um, a document g leading the way, but that they can implement it uh, with the means and the people that they have. Because it's too complicated, they won't implement it. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. Um, and Isabel, keeping with the sort of global health uh, line, I'm wondering if you think, you know, if we find a cure in the next couple of years, if we're going to see the same access problems that we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic with vaccines, for example, if we will see, would see that again with HIV. We have it with the Mpox vaccine. So like all the European countries hoarded the vaccines. <laughs> So like they did the same with uh, COVID and pox. So I think it's, it's very probable that it will happen. So we as community have to to play our role as well to to advocate for solid global solidarity. And it's you know it's a pub it's public health common sense to make vac you know to to share uh, globally. But also um, you were asking why it's a, an interest to. Th to look at global health, and we've seen it with uh, COVID and with MPOX, that it's good to collaborate between continents to share knowledge, but also that HIV, because it has been handled in a multidisciplinary way, it actually strengthens health systems. So I think this is why like continued attention can be can be useful to continue develop the, the, the health system. And uh, when you talked about populist, it's worrisome as well because there will be the replenishment of the global fund in a couple of years, uh, you know, and, and it's needed. It's, so what will happen, uh, what will happen then? With those replenishments, we've also seen in, you know, the last year or two, it's been increasingly difficult. There's more and more people asking for more and more money and there's yeah. not that much money to go around. Sarah, I'm wondering, you know, how concerned you are about, you know, looking to the future of HIV and looking to the future of uh, there are new treatments coming, there are new innovations, getting those to the people who need them. You know, how concerned are you that they might not get to those people? And potentially, what can we do now 
to try solve that issue? It's a big question, yeah. so I don't have, expect you to have the whole answer. But. No, that's a, the, that's a big but very interesting question because I, I think wh what we can do now is actually, and uh, when I hear Anne Isabel and uh, talking, uh, is uh, we're next week we're going to hopefully approve a COVID report from the European Parliament on what happened and lessons for the future. And there's a lot there that can resonate to other epidemics out there, uh, pandemics and also endemics. And this is something that that we need to keep working, and not only on reports or positions of Parliament on any reports, but also, for instance, what we are working now on the pharma uh, legislation package, what we are working now on the European health data space, for instance, to have better data for research and innovation. All of this can impact HIV. And when we are talking about HIV, and this is something that I try to convince to my colleagues, we're not addressing one disease at a time. When we address HIV, we can also address and put tools out there to, that can be used for other communicable diseases. Uh, that's, that was at least my goal, for instance, when I was talking about, when we were talking about other uh, diseases such as cancer, that they can be mimicked to other non-communicable diseases. And, and for HIV, this can be the same for other communicable diseases such as monkeypox, but others that can arise, there's uh, the list is very big of, of uh, virus uh, uh, microorganisms that we need to be um, careful on. Unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately, but that's also based true on, 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 on the importance of getting one health out there because we have disrupted the system a lot. Hence, we, we need also to to work now to recover it. And um, that's something that we're doing now and we need to be doing now because when we speak about HIV, we need to also understand that a lot of the regulations that we do in the parliament, of a lot of the legislation can tackle this indirectly. When we are talking about the nature restoration law and restoring our ecosystems, we're actually talking about putting homeostasis back into the, the life, into the planet, into the nature, and that will uh, directly affect our health, that will directly affect how we get infected by zoonosis, for instance. And this is something um, that it's, it's very important not to understand not to forget that, as Maggie said, stated, uh, climate crisis is a health crisis and can impact health directly and indirectly. I'm going to roll back a little bit to presidencies because we have a question from Serena Shivu um, from uh, QHIV Outcomes. And they're asking, how is Belgium aiming to continue their agenda on HIV set up by the Spanish presidency? Now, Maggie, I know you're not in government, but I'm, I'm wondering how you think, well, what you would like to see. From I've been for maybe <laughs> nine years, that was enough, thank you. But uh, <laughs> uh, as you know, for the European presidency, always three countries are working together. One who had the presidency, one who is going to have it, and one who has it now. So that's the so the, the the meeting and uh, there we see that there has to be a continuity so that I think of course uh, since we have a good track record on that that we will it will be one topic uh, also for us uh, and uh, then uh, I, I for the future I still see some uh, really big uh, problems if it comes to um, helping uh, HIV patients patients in uh, hospitals, that's okay. If it's in society, that is also well organized. But what if they get older? What if they get into elderly homes? Now we see here that 47% of our population uh, who is infected are over 50. I don't mean that people of 50 years have to go to elderly homes, but... <laughs> as they have a, a normal life e expectancy, they will yes. get there once. And then, of course, in elderly homes, uh, they don't have the 
the the habits to take uh, more to to be preventive to to know what uh, comorbidities can be and so like that so that i think it's uh, for the coming years uh, um, is also very important for our country to see how we're going to tackle that knowing that institutional we are the most we are a little country but we are a very uh, um, difficult institutional so that uh, <laughs> elderly homes are uh, really uh, so the legislation is done by the regions uh, so and uh, of course um, it's important to to see that also there there are measures taking to help them to get them access also and uh, to see that they have the the, the care they need Thanks, Maggie. I think you're not the only European country that has these complexities with the regionalised healthcare systems. Um, we're getting near the end, and I wanted to go back to this goal to end AIDS, the public health threat by 2030. And I know it sounds like maybe Belgium's not too far off, but I wonder how far the panellists each think um, Europe is of reaching this goal. Um, and, you know, whether you think we're going to potentially uh, miss some of these goals um, that, that have been set um, uh, Anne Isabel, maybe would you like to go first? I don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> um, doesn't look too good now, I would say. And um, you know, even when you reach your goals, you will not reach it for everyone. And that's really we c that's from our perspective, it's not acceptable that some people will be left behind. And so we need to work harder. Um, <sighs> Yeah, I think there needs to be a discussion about what after th 2030, because we're not going to probably reach the goal. It's not to say that we should be pessimistic. There's still some hope because there are smart people around. There are people actually compared to other fields, the HIV field is really well networked and multidisciplinary, as you mentioned. And there's a lot of mutual support. So for instance, when COVID happened, when MPOX happened, like it was the HIV field that really reconnected to find solutions, whether in community or clinical. So I think we can count on that in the future, that infrastructure, and that needs to be sustained. But uh, yeah, I don't, I'm afraid I don't have the answer. Sarah, what do you think? I mean, from the da data out there, I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic, but again, we need to close the gap on this very targeted epidemic that we are having now. We need to reach these vulnerable groups. I'll give you an example. For instance, I, I used to work used to work, well, I work uh, in um, the suburb of Lisbon that uh, we deal with uh, nearly half a million citizens in the public health field. And uh, we had there ver lots of these vulnerable groups and we were not reaching them. So we, we, what they do now is they have targeted consults of reproductive and sexual health where can, they can get access to screening, they can ac get access to PrEP, and uh, w one thing that works really well there is that uh, the, the lift of the barrier, if you are um, registered or not in Portugal. So you can still with COVID, you, you can, you could, with COVID, this was one of the good measures that came out of it was that uh, you could get an NHS uh, number and access to NHS regardless of your uh, registration status in Portugal. So this allowed a lot of people that were in, uh, in not registered or in a different status to reach health. And it's these barriers that we need to lift, these barriers that we need to lift to reach the 2030 goals, but also not forget our responsibility with the global health in reaching the global our. Um, uh, in also our role in the global health to reach this goal, uh, these goals as a whole. Thanks, Sarah. And Maggie, your thoughts? Well, I certainly agree, but uh, um, it's not because we are 2030 that the virus will uh, disappear like that. So the virus is still alive, it's still having mutations. So, you know, 
uh, whoever thought that Corona uh, would be get so violent, uh, n no, not one scientific uh, knew it before, so now we know it, that it can mutate to a more aggressive virus. Uh, that's why medication research uh, always has to continue, but because we know that uh, when the virus has mutations, some medication is not helping anymore and we need other. So also the, the vaccination is promising, but it's not, uh, you know, that there is a big uh, anti-vax uh, movement also growing, uh, so that we had to struggle with also during Corona. People who think uh, if I swim every day in cold water, I won't get the virus and uh, things like that. Uh, uh, so, of course, uh, that is, uh, I think vaccines would be very good, but uh, that not that it, they would help everyone. So there still be people infected if I say in Belgium two every day for me it's too much we're going to look at the the poll the word cloud uh, was which was presented by Gilead and the question was I'm going to ask our panelists as well what they what they would answer so what is the key priority at the EU and national levels to eliminate the HIV epidemic in Europe what is the most um, the biggest one that I can see on my screen is prevention and stigma, tackling stigma. That looks like the, the most common. I'm wondering what our panelists think the biggest um, priority should be to eliminate the epidemic. One word, one little phrase. Not Can it be a phrase? A phrase is all right. Okay. Accessibility to all stages of prevention, primordial, primary, secondary, tertiary, and so on. Accessibility. Thanks, Sarah. And Isabel? I think I would second that, access. Access to the, the whole range of services, treatment, diagnostic tools, everything. <laughs> access. We well, yes. have access to innovation. <laughs> but um, also just do it. Just do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't preach, do it. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so That's much. Um, and it's clear that we're not going to end AIDS and that, uh, just yet, and there's a lot of work, more work to be done uh, to get there. Uh, it's not easy work or work that's necessarily going to win politicians um, more votes. It's work in prisons, it's work with migrants, with the most marginalised in societies, um, and it's about all these tools, the testing, prevention, treatment, and innovative new treatments as well. It's also about stigma and the long, hard work to eliminate that. Um, Thank you to our speakers for joining us and you, the audience, uh, for joining us both in person and online. Um, and finally, to our partner Gilead for making this event possible. Thank you very much. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback. You can say how wonderful this was. So feel free to email us um, about the event at live at politico.eu. You can check out our events website for the latest lineup on all our events happening this year, including our Healthcare Summit, which is happening in October on the 24th to the 25th in Brussels. I hope to see you all there. Thank you very much. This is an, an age of disruption, of profound revolutionary change. What we're really asking ministers is to empower the ambassadors. The only thing that you really push forth is the truth. You don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic. Mm -hmm.